night, everybody. Hello, and welcome to the first live recording of the Beta Kid Podcast. Today, we are recording uh, another one of our Canadian Tech AMA episodes. And for some reason, we thought, uh, why not do this on Twitter in front of a digital audience? So while we have some previously submitted questions, I think we're going to take a stab at having an audience question or two, if possible. And if you are just a normal Beta Kid Podcast subscriber wondering what the hell I'm talking about, don't worry about it. <laughs> just go about your normal daily Everything podcast consumption schedule and uh this will be absolutely no different right uh, we shall see okay to help us out with this we've got our ama power panel uh i guess that includes me i should say who i am because right now i'm i am beta kit i am the host but i'm also douglas saltis editor-in-chief of beta kit founder of beta kit incorporated uh to my l- right on my app uh we have beta kit podcast co-host Rob Kennedy. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and to his right on my app, <laughs> we have Beta Kid Associate Editor Megan Simpson. Hello. Uh, not joining us today is our podcast producer, uh, Katie, because she is on vacation, uh, which I think is probably, uh, it means two things. It means <laughs> the first question we're about to ask is going to make a lot more sense in this AMA. Uh, but also it means that I am going to be functioning a little bit more as a host for this AMA, uh, managing the Twitter spaces, people asking, uh, anyone who wants to ask questions, but then also making sure that Rob and Megan, uh, stay on point and keep it 100 with their answers. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll get started. If at any time you guys have a question, you want to jump in, uh, I believe there are methods to do that within Twitter spaces and we'll look to maybe call you up and ask a question, please try not to ruin our day with the question you might ask. Uh, we will do our best to answer them, uh, but please please be kind to us at the end of a long week uh, in which we have been working very hard and watching uh, parts of the world burn. Um, but we'll, we'll get started, and you know, this question's a plant, but it's an easy one, and I think it'll set the stage. Uh, Rob, go to you first. <laughs> is all of this being done because our podcast producer, Katie Lohr, is actually on vacation, and we had no other easy way <laughs> of recording this week's episode. Well, that's the catalyst for it, Douglas. But I think this is really cool. I think it'd be really fun to talk to people uh, and hear their questions live and really stump us, as opposed to tweet stump us. Uh, but the short TLDR is yes. Yeah, okay, that's fair. And the, the tweet stumpings are interesting because normally when we do these AMAs, we're kind of collecting questions throughout the week, and then we have some time to pr- prepare and curate, and then the final product is... Uh, our best guesses uh, going forward. But um, I guess for this one, we're just going to have to like wing it and, and do our best. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe to uh, preempt someone asking this question, um, (laughs) maybe in a context we wouldn't be prepared for, but obviously uh, all of us are heavy on Twitter. We're very, we're very much online and, I think anyone on Twitter this week has been uh, readily aware of what's happening in uh, the global geo- geopolitical space. Um, first question we should probably get out of the way or, or first topic is what's going on with Ukraine and then maybe the impact of what's happening in Ukraine on the global tech space broadly and maybe uh, how that impacts uh, Canadian tech companies uh, Canadian Ukrainians uh, here working at tech companies, uh, everything like that. Megan, you and I were actually talking about this. Uh, we, well, I guess we've been talking about it every day uh, mm. as part of our normal course of evaluating the news. Um, but we were also talking about it uh, a couple hours before recording. Um, mm-hmm. What what is what is your as the associate editor of Beta Kit um, when you have a geopolitical event? affecting all aspects of kind of like global news and discourse. How are you looking to see where that overlaps or ladders into kind of our beat, which is like Canadian tech and innovation. And from the Baker podcast perspective, you know, maybe uh, global tech and innovation from the mm-hmm. Canadian perspective. Yeah, that's a tough one for sure. Because it's, it's you know, when these, sort of things happen. I mean, that, oh, well, this event being very, very unique, obviously. Um, but, but when these like, you know, geopolitical or big world events happen, it's always like, okay, is, is this something that Beta Kit as a B2B tech publication 
needs to cover? How does this affect our readers? Like, what are we looking at? I think, you know, it, it's almost a good example. Like when, when COVID first hit, you know, mm -hmm. the very, very beginning of COVID, we're like, okay, like, you know, there's this flu thing. And like, you know, I guess some people aren't in their offices. And we, then we once our office for two weeks. Yeah. And we're like, oh, we're just gonna... and then, you know, we realized once we're all at home, whoa, this completely changes how we cover news. Right. Like, and what we were covering. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily have like a, you know, one shot, like good answer, but it's just, you have to look and see how what's happening on a global stage is affecting the community that you write for the, the audience that's reading your news every day. And, um, I don't necessarily know what that looks like for, for, you know, this world event right now mm -hmm. but um, it's definitely something we're thinking about as you as you've noted we've had conversations all week about it right so yeah well and i think even sharing for our listeners that process of how we think about it and how we talk about it yeah. is useful because you know i think you made a great connection in terms of the case of covid even not even discounting the fact that like at the beginning of like march 2020 we we're all like oh yeah we're going to be out of the office for two weeks yeah. um even even when there was obviously people were staying from home, wash your hands, self-isolate, um, you know, all six feet apart, all of that stuff. I think it wasn't until, you know, we were obviously tracking that stuff, but we were, we were, there's an overlap between, you know, government announcements as it relates to tech. And there's an mm -hmm. overlap of like national news impacting tech. I don't think it was until maybe May or June that we're like, a, every government imp, uh, story an announcement right now impacts our audience because yeah. it impacts every Canadian. And yeah. we had to have conversations about fundamentally altering how we would traditionally cover government announcements because it was impacting every Canadian business, which included all the Canadian businesses that we write about. So mm -hmm. like, I think that was not one where we had it immediately. And it was one where even, I don't know if we were a little late to it, but it kind of like smacked us up in the head in, in May and June where we're like, we need to completely change our processes for reporting what we're focused on we had a list of like how uh canadian tech companies are stepping up in support of covid we had yep. uh like government and watches we were we were covering small business loans to support canadian mm -hmm. tech in ways we were never were before and I, I think you know two days into this current scenario i don't think we necessarily have answers there but we're definitely yeah. spending cycles trying to understand where that might intersect now we've already seen some intersection points uh, that might be interesting, and I'll, I'll maybe note these and then throw to Rob for his perspective as just kind of yeah. like an everyday citizen who is also a podcast host. Um, but just if people are looking for obvious overlaps to uh, Canadian tech, we have definitely seen um, there is a like uh, tech editor at Forbes Ukraine has noted the number of Ukrainian uh, companies or a uh, Ukrainian founded. Uh, tech companies that everyone's using uh, nowadays from like WhatsApp to PayPal to um, Snapchat uh, to uh, Grammarly, Revolut, uh, tons of Ukrainian connections there. From a Canadian perspective, we covered uh, an early stage company that just got access to one of the Google accelerators, Paperstack, that has Ukrainian based founders. And then on the other side of there, um, I think everyone generally knows the Canadian connection with Ethereum uh, and then uh, a relationship with uh, Vitalik, who is actually uh, Russian born um, or of Russian heritage. And the, I think the public statements that he's made in relation to uh, support of Ukraine. And uh, I think he's got one tweet that really um, stands out to me where he said something like, um, remember, Ethereum is neutral, but I am not which is um, a pretty strong take from a very, very public tech leader. Uh, Rob, how are you coming in on this? And then maybe we'll look to get some, some of our audience in here asking questions. I think Mud threw up a, an emoji hand wave, which I'm going to take not as just a hello, but maybe he had a question. I think that's maybe a good signal for our audience. If they want to uh, ask a question, they can toss up the emoji hands and we'll get to them. But uh, how, how are you viewing this as kind of like a person in tech who is also a news consumer who also, you know, co-hosts a podcast with baby Kid. Yeah. I think a few things like it's funny, the Vitalik tweet, it's funny because the immediately trolled underneath it. 
<laughs> about Ethereum, yeah. which is really irritating. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, the things that came to mind for me were, um, you know, Canada is a land of immigrants. Uh, you know, I'm a first generation Canadian. My parents escaped Hungary in the 50s, uh, which was in the, what was called the communist revolution. It actually failed. Um, and Hungary is not far <laughs> from the Ukraine. And mm. I think that uh, we have to realize that since we are so, I mean, to point of the previous tweet, we're such a multicultural society that we actually are directly impacted. Uh, so that's the first thing to think of, I think. Um, and so the second thing I, I think as a corollary is, you know, we've for the last, what, 20, 30, 40 years, we're like, yeah, Europe's stable. I can work from anywhere. I can work from Germany. I can work from mm -hmm. California, whatever. I think we're now like, is how stable is Europe? Can I start a company? Can I just work from Germany? Can I just work from the Ukraine? It, are they going to stop at the Ukraine? So I think that some of the fundamental assumptions that we've made about our you know, where you can start a tech company and where your customers are and just everything's the same, it's clearly not. And then I think finally, the other thing that I thought was that was interesting is as oil prices go up, often that means the Canadian dollar, the strength of the dollar goes up. But if you look at the strength of the dollar now, it hasn't. Uh, and so I think it's another push to us as Canadians to be like, well, hold on a second. We need to be not just a natural resource-based economy. We can't just be dependent on one thing, and our fate as a country depends on whether a country is being invaded or not. That's kind of insane. Yeah. Well, particularly when uh, the, hey, cheap labor and shred credits component doesn't really factor in because the remote work scenario caused by uh, COVID means that that's just like, that's not for investment into Canadian companies now, that's for be for, for greater poaching and reverse arbitrage from international companies. But it's interesting mm -hmm. you're mentioning this, you know, um, from Megan's perspective, she tied it to um, how Baykit's internal editorial process changed related to COVID. Hearing you talk, Robert, it kind of reminds me a little bit more related to 2017 scenario with the Trump travel ban um, mm -hmm. that was, again, a global event that didn't necessarily, well, I guess it ended up impacting Canadian tech because it was an incredible recruiting uh, tool for people to maybe build companies in Canada and, and or move to Canada rather than being in the United States. But that was a circumstance that impacted so many um, Canadian founders, Canadian entrepreneurs, Canadian workers that had some sort of international heritage that was suddenly deemed uh, unworthy or suspect by the U.S. government to the point uh, that we were the host and co-authors of an open letter against the Trump travel ban on representing the Canadian tech community that had like thousands of people sign it. I kind of feel like this is one of those geopolitical events that might be similar to that, where there's just a lot of people that you're going to learn about. And I've certainly been learning, seeing, um, you know, Canadian based reporters who have Ukrainian family members right now that they're speaking to while still trying to do their jobs of the, the that personal impact and that personal cost a lot more than say, maybe the macro considerations of something like COVID. Let's move on to our next question. I love how the people who submit these questions for us really like to take it easy on us. It's been a really running theme in these AMA episodes. <laughs> um, so while there's a geopolitical crisis going on, uh, closer to home, there is a, a much more uh, or significantly urgent crisis uh, related to the great tech sell-off that's happening in North America, where tech stocks continue to get hammered. Uh, I think we've seen well, Shopify was the latest to get absolutely drummed after uh, reporting results that were only very good rather than, oh my God, the pandemic changed all of commerce. Uh, we saw Lightspeed's Dax De Silva step down as CEO of the company after basically running the thing for 15 years because the share price had dropped, what, like 70% over six months? Uh, no one survives contact with the public markets at a drop like that. And then uh, I, we actually just did, uh, Baitica just did a um, Patreon live conversation with the CEOs of uh, Truly You and Clio, two BC tech SaaS unicorns. Uh, and they were talking uh, how they're viewing the public markets and kind of noting that their slow and methodical approach to not rushing to IPO is warranted because if you see uh, the public markets as the destination, rather as another point in the journey, you will not be prepared to weather um, <laughs> the bludgeoning that might come uh, during a, a sell-off right now. Um, uh, I, I strongly recommend if you are not a, 
a beta get Patreon supporter and can't uh, access the conversation we had to, to stay, keep on the lookout for the article write-up that we'll publish uh, on beta kit next week for the the full write-up on that because I think seeing uh, two CEOs of Canadian unicorns speak so specifically and honestly about uh, how nonplussed they are about <laughs> the public markets is really um, rare. But bringing it back to uh, the question that we got, uh, and I think it's an open question that many people have been asking, what impact do you think the tech sell-off uh, will or is having on private company and startup valuations? Um, and Rob, as like a, a startup founder yourself and a dude who has uh, participated in the, the exits of uh, certain tech companies, wh- how are you tracking this? I mean, I'm certainly not an expert with, when it comes to this kind of stuff, but what I would say is that, I mean, they usually track. Usually it's a leading indicator of something, right? Assuming we don't go back to the kind of decade of companies like Uber staying public and holding themselves uh, for some other, you know, uh, some other weird kind of, like the, the sexiness of keeping it uh, 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 Uber private and Airbnb and those kinds of companies was really cool. And then it became uncool when there was much capital to be had. So I think like from a valuation perspective, I think uh, things are still pretty hot. It could be a leading indicator of uh, those valuations going down, but it still feels like there's a lot more people investing in companies than there are people building companies that are actually investable items. So I think like it, it, I'll be interested to see what the distance in that lag looks like. I mean, it does definitely feel like on the uh, on the IPO side of things, um, I always feel like it's a mad rush. You know, it's like, oh, everyone's IPOing right now. Like we did a podcast, what was it, a year or two ago with uh, General Assembly, like the pizza company was IPOing. So it felt like there's fashionable times to do it. And then there are not fashionable times to, uh, uh, to do it as well, right? Um, yeah, that's what I... That's my initial very hot, hot take. <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems like things are unfashionable. And I, I think, you know, when we when we look to answer questions like this, we're obviously going and speaking to uh, VCs, right? The people who, from our perspective, kind of have boots on the ground uh, tracking this stuff. And I know I've talked to uh, a couple of VCs recently about this. I think there's been some like open like conversations or articles asking this question. And I, I think what we've kind of heard at beta kit recently about this is there isn't concern really necessarily right now, simply because there's been so much capital into the space and the um, valuations that it isn't a worry that there's going to be a dip. Now I think the the worry is that for companies who weren't looking to get uh, raise money in this current environment because they didn't need it or they weren't looking to just get access to cheap capital and, and, and grab it, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of issues for companies 12 or 18 months uh, down the road when things have softened and they're, they're having a harder time raising that follow-on round or justifying how things slow down. And they're going to have to have that like, well what happened was kind of thing. And there's going to be, you know, for every unicorn that we've covered on beta kit recently, we're going to be having articles in the next 12 to 18 months about companies having down or flat flat rounds and them trying to justify that as, you know, Oh yeah, we just, you know, strategically this was the best thing for us or um, that because the circumstances will have changed. Um, And it's really interesting for, to be speaking to VCs and having them be, be focused right now on the company's next, not their current round, but their next round and, and having to figure out the Delta between the super easy, huge valuation they were able to get now and how that's not going to continue into the next circumstance. Um, well, if I could just say one more thing. I mean, yeah. don't, don't forget things like the interest rates changing. There's a lot that's changing. So that also factors into these things. And the other thing that's worth noting, I think, is when it comes to talent, we've spent a lot of time talking about the crazy talent wars that are going on. Uh, You do on the site, we do on the podcast. And if you think about it, while these acquisitions happen, when when these acquisitions happen, a lot of those employees are given options in those public companies that vest over time. So uh, if you're 
uh, a, a employee of a company that was acquired by Shopify or you, you name the company, uh, they're probably looking at what their value, <laughs> what the stock is that the options that they've got and thinking carefully about what their next steps are. Is this a, is this a flash in the pan or is this a long-term trend? Yeah. No, and the interest rates is interesting how, too as well because we've seen um, huge valuations, but we've also seen a lot of um, debt being flying around as well for those smart companies that you know might want to take advantage of that as well. So I, I think there's going to be a, a lot of, of changes going, unless you know, for example, there's just so much capital that has to fill its container or lest it spill over that it's going to continue to fuel activity. The, you know, irrespective of what the valuation should be in. And we're, we're in a super bubble, but, you know, ways to be seen. Megan, is there like, from a reporter at BetaKit perspective, when you're fundamentally writing these stories, do you want to talk a little bit about like how you look at uh, a company's history when they're maybe looking to announce around and the things that have come before and, and how we triangulate on how that relates to the narrative? Because, you know, I think probably with within your time at BetaKit, this will be the first <laughs> downturn yes. you might have participated in. But mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering if you can just for our audience share a little bit how you approach connecting the dots on what's happened before to what a company is announcing in the moment and what might be anticipated and like what goes into us trying to put all those dots in order rather than just say, Hey, they got money today. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not easy <laughs> first. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of work and understanding. I think uh, you're right. I, I wasn't around uh, with BetaKit or even or even a business journalist, right, for the dot com bubble or the 2008 finite. Like I wasn't around for that stuff. So this would be kind of the first time I'm experiencing that. But you know, when we look at companies who have raised money, we look okay. Have they raised more money in this round than last time? What are they classifying this round as? Like, you know, is this a bridge for them? Is this, this oh is no, it does seed round yet? <laughs> is it their fourth seed round in, in how many, you know, years or whatever? Um uh yeah, like like uh oh my goodness, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, it's so like have they raised a bit more money than the last time? What's the distance between that? And kind of just asking founders or CEOs, entrepreneurs, like, how did this funding round come about? Tell me, like, like what's going mm -hmm. on here? And just trying to understand that. Did their um, prime investors follow on? Is yeah, there a new strategic? Yeah. Exactly. Who are the investors? Yeah, there, there's lots of kind of stuff that go into that. I think to one of your earlier points, though, VCs that I've spoken to as well who have experienced the dot-com bubble of the 2008 financial crisis, they say, you know what? Yeah, there probably will be a pullback at some point, but I think a lot are saying it's not necessarily going to be fatal. You know, mm -hmm. like it, like it might have been in the past because of how much the Canadian tech ecosystem has grown and matured in like the last decade. Right. Yeah. Now I don't know. I have, you know, I, I've only been around doing this for, you know, <laughs> half that time, not even. So I, I, I can't well, say and, from and my own experience, you, but during that entire time valuations and the amount of dollars raised have only gone up. Right. It's been, it's been yeah. slow and steady for a decade, but it has been, I, I think it's ex obviously accelerated in the last bit, but it, it's gone up. But I, I completely agree with you because it seems like, you know, the smart VCs are looking at this, aren't worried that there isn't going to be capital out there yeah. for companies to raise. Because even if, you know, even if at each stage, um, financing drops or tightens by 20%, that's still historically higher than any time before 2020 for all of Canadian tech, right? Because we've such, mm -hmm. seen such a market explosion at all stages. They're They're really worried about the companies that like, raised a huge amount of money at a crazy yeah. valuation and what they're going to do if that doesn't hit. Now, I will note, we, we tried to get um, Damien Steele from uh, Omer's Ventures on. He wasn't available today, but we're, I think we're thinking of doing a specific podcast with him on valuations because I know there's one company in the space that we haven't covered yet because we want to have a conversation mm -hmm. around it. Because we, there were uh, when I was reaching out to VC saying, how the hell does a company raise $35 million around on a $1 billion valuation, the response I was yeah. getting was, are you in our private VC chat? Because we're asking that too. Um, I think <laughs> there, you know, from the reporter perspective, there's a bit, uh, we only have the publicly shared information. 
And there's a lot more that goes into this related to terms of the deal that never gets seen or shared uh, that it can impact that. So we're kind of looking forward to have Damien on a future podcast soon to talk through how VCs see it, other things that don't get publicly announced that might come into play and, you know, breaking the illusion that there is a strong correlation between the amount of money raised and the valuation, but Mm -hmm. um, underscoring some of the considerations that actually truly motivate that. Um, But I I just wanted to note that as a, it's more, VCs are more worried about what their founders are going to do when they're having to justify super flat or down rounds publicly after, you know, really going to the press with uh, explosive numbers than they are about access to capital. Um, I think we had, I'm getting a heads up from my director of ops, who's also here, uh, saying that I believe James raised an emoji hand, perhaps ask a question. Do you want to introduce like who you are and what you uh, do? Okay, so I, I used to be a tech reporter for the Financial Post. Uh, for the last year and a half, I've been um, doing communications for the Council of Canadian Innovators. Uh, we're a business council of scale up tech companies. I'm, I'm not here in that official capacity. I'm just here as like a, a fan of beta kit, but it's, it's hard to take off the sort of um, champion for, you know, Canadian scale up tech companies hat. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got, I've, I've got all kinds of questions, but I, I think the one I kind of want to ask everyone on the panel right now, and I guess this is targeted at um, Canadian tech specifically, of course, but it kind of ties into all of the earlier stuff and everything going on in the space right now. And it's just, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? How are, like, what is your vibe right now about <laughs> tech and, and where you are in the world? Like how we compete globally, how we navigate, you know, pick any number of challenges. Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you somewhere in the middle? How are you feeling, Douglas? And I, I, I love how I love how the first ever live question during a beta kit AMA ever asked with two minutes of preamble that literally had me shaking in my boots ended up being guys, vibe check on Canadian tech. How are you feeling? Um, thank you, James, for your question. Uh, I'm going to remove you from the speakers and then we are going to, um, I guess, try to answer that question and we're going to check in on the vibes. Um, I don't know, Megan, do you want to, do you want to vibe check first? What, what can we get a, <laughs> a, a vibe? <laughs> uh, I want to, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my vibe. Um, cause you're, cause you're, you are literally the person that is like putting your hands on the metal and feeling like how the engine's humming day by day doing the reporting, right? So that is a very interesting way to put that. Um, yeah, my vibe check, I would say vibe generally good. I, I don't know. <laughs> vibe is uh, strong. Vibe, vibe generally good. I mean, you know, what's really interesting. And we were talking, it's got me thinking because we we're talking back to when I joined beta kit, which was early 2019. Um, feels like a lot longer, uh, you know, long few years, but, mm-hmm. um, it's it got me thinking like when I did start, you know, there were still like smaller funding rounds than there are now. Like we really saw the boom over the past couple of years that I've been here at beta kit. So I've seen a lot of like, I saw that kind of early, like, okay, oh, yeah, things are like going pretty steady. And then I saw that boom. So, I mean, I don't know. I generally <laughs> vibe good. If we're going with that, like, I think there is still a lot of positivity happening um, when I have been able to get out in the tech ecosystem and actually mm. like see and talk to people like, you know, we'll talk about your experience in kitchen water this week. Oh, sure. Yeah. What were I you, got to see, why were you in kitchen Waterloo this week? I got to see real live humans uh, on Tuesday <laughs> in Kitchener Waterloo. Um, I visited Communitech because Communitech was celebrating uh, the ringing of the Toronto Stock Exchange bell, the opening of the markets on Tuesday. First time that that had ever taken place in K Dubs. And um, yeah, it was always awesome. I, I hosted a panel there afterwards uh, with the. Um, John Baker, D2L, who actually rang the bell. Um, Martin, CEO of Apply Boards. Uh, Aaron from Dozer. Chris of Communitech. And it was just great even just like seeing people 
in person in Kitchener Waterloo that I hadn't seen in what felt like two or three years. So, um, you know, just being in that environment, it, it really changes from sitting behind your desk and just getting emails every day. You know, it was really interesting that you say, you know, I have my hand on the engine, I feel it, but it's all very remote these days, right? So, mm. you know, yes, you can totally feel it, but I think- So you, you gotta can... Tokyo drift that car right out into <laughs> the, uh into the garage and, and have people <laughs> remark on how uh, incredibly powerful the engine was this week. Mm, mm, yes, exactly. Exactly. The metaphor is dying slowly. Okay, Rob, let's get you in here. Um, you know, you're a noted anxious and negative person. What, what's your vibe check? <laughs> and then so, so just before you answer, I know Jason, I saw your hand up. We will get to you <laughs> next, sir. Post vibe check. <laughs> cool. Uh, so I think the, the, the definition of Rob Kennedy is cynical optimist. Is that a good? Uh, <laughs> Own your brand, uh, sir. Own your brand. Okay. 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 Uh, cranky cynical optimist. Um, so I think like, it's, it's a great question. And I think it's, I think we're, so we're I think we are at a confluence of thing uh, in time of actually some pretty good. Sh I'm actually quite optimistic about it. I think we're in the middle of a tech uh, revolution. So unlike the dot-com boom, which I was a part of, <laughs> um, these are real transformational things that are happening to our society. And we're as good as anyone else in the world to come up with those uh, technology companies. So I think we've, we've not, we're not just creating these fume based companies, but we're actually creating companies that have actual tangible value in the world. Second, mm. I think, uh, I think we're like on iteration six <laughs> of the ecosystem. Uh, maybe not the Silicon Valley iteration 73, but look at, you've got people like uh, backbone angels. These are people who like, uh, You've got people investing in the ecosystem who have succeeded within the ecosystem. Um, I don't recall seeing that as much, not even 10 years ago. So I think you're seeing the wealth that's been created is being put back into the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is really cool. But if you look at it along the three dimensions that startups uh, really care about, talent, capital, and customers, from a talent perspective, we talked about it early on this show. Uh, Donald Trump helped drive a lot of immigrants to our country, which is great. We need them <laughs> to innovate and build a new and better Canada. Uh, and you can now work globally. So you can live here uh, and build a global company from Canada. And I think we're going to see more of that happening than we did before, especially because of COVID. Um, the, the, the challenge we'll have is, um, can we get, you know, the Series D, Series D, like, people who have built these really scaling companies, there's not that many of those humans in Canada. So we need to attract those people back or to this country to kind of help uh, our Canadian success stories be more successful. From a capital perspective, we're seeing a lot of capital, uh, more funds are coming. We still have that weird like A, Series A, B kind of gap sort of thing where I think entrepreneurs are still, I, I still think entrepreneurs in Canada who are worth their salt aren't just sitting on their hands and waiting for Canadian VCs or investors to cut. They're looking globally, and I think we're seeing them be successful. Uh, I think the place we're falling down the most is uh, customers. I think uh, we're still a very risk of our society. So uh, we've talked about this on the podcast about procurement being <laughs> fucked um, uh, nationally, and, and, and enterprises are still reluctant to uh, work with startups in Canada. So I think uh, our, our Canadian uh, companies are looking outside of the country to try to test their ideas when they're in the B2B space. So I think I'm generally pretty optimistic. I think we're in the right place at the right time if we capitalize on this opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how much of the podcasts that we've recorded and have kind of in the can for future weeks, I heard you kind of like referring to in that. Um, yeah, c completely, agree. especially like the procurement thing. We've, we've got a couple more uh, interviews with some health tech companies that are just like incredibly frustrated. And then at that, that later stage, that D and le beyond level, we just saw this week how difficult that can be with ClearCo having their CEO become uh, executive chairman. Uh, with their uh, other co-founder taking over. Now there's additional considerations there given the relationship between those two co-founders changing. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the one thing that we don't have. I agree with you fundamentally that the uh, there's so much activity and so much funding in the ecosystem that even if there's, there's, just, there's just too much there now for one company's failure or one downturn to significantly um, impact things. Um, what I'm looking at is really how we now have two anchor ecosystems 
in Canadian tech that are specifically like very frothy in Toronto, Vancouver, um, while Montreal, Calgary, Kitchener, Waterloo, and Ottawa are all still figuring it out. It, we now have two ecosystems that have kind of completed the flywheel in terms of early stage to late stage financing, which is really, really interesting. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I'm not, when I get pessimistic or darkest timeline Douglas, it's not really related to uh, about health checks or vibe checks related to Canadian tech ecosystem. It's more related to um, tech impact on the world generally, and, and maybe some of the bad actors in that space, which we will uh, get into the second half of the podcast. But first, ultimate vibe check. Did you know that the Beta Kit podcast is sponsored by Pocketed? Pocketed helps small businesses get money directly in their pockets with easy to access to government funding, tax credits, and business incentives. Join Pocketed today by visiting hellopocketed.io and use the referral code BETAKIT for exclusive perks and offers to start adding value to your ventures today. Before we get to some of those back-end questions, we do have a, a request here. So you're going up on stage, sir, being out as a speaker, and let's hear your question. So I run a startup in Waterloo, and I've been running it since 2016. And we don't raise funding. Like, we uh, sell products, and whatever revenues we generate from them is what we use to fund our company as well as our future R&D. So I would love to get advice from you or Megan on how we should go about our press releases or anything like that because we have good metrics, but we have no funding associated with that. Thank you so much. Mm, okay. Yeah, no, not a problem. Great question. Megan, I think I'm going to take this one because this is literally what I do all day when I do office hours with companies on Fridays. Um, and I, I think it's a gr great question. And uh, there's two things here. First, there's absolutely no shame in being a bootstrap company and building off the revenue that you accrue. Uh, I think it's a complete misconception or fabrication in this space that um, the financings amounts are in, in, indicative of, of success. They're indicative of financial exchanges. Betakit is a bootstrapped business that we have built off of, you know, the death of my hairline and the, the growth of my waistline. Um, and I think we're very proud of that. Um, now to your point of storytelling, you know, when I'm talking with companies, I think when, when we do office hours, when we connect with companies or when we get people like Damien Steele or other VCs to contribute, uh, to beta kit, either on the podcast or through, um, op-eds that we publish. Part of that is to provide more resources, more guidelines to early stage founders out there to course correct on things they might not know, things they might need help with, things that might not be talked about enough. We're publishing an op-ed on Monday about founder mental health and how it's not being talked about enough still. Um, and so I think this is a circumstance where we look to actors in the space to come out because they know all the VCs, like the lead VC at Omer's Ventures, the person running Omer's Ventures is really concerned about all the funding round announcements and the valuations because he knows that fundamentally those things aren't real or don't, aren't, don't have real impacts on the business to the extent that people reading Baby Kit feel. We also deal with all the time companies that see us covering lots of funding rounds and feel like, oh, Betakit is only interested in that rather than, well, Betakit has a responsibility to cover that information. Um, we, we like to tell other stories, but we don't get pitched that as much or is not, there aren't that many stories relative to like company scale, company success. One of the specific things in the last year we've really focused on, um, particularly through the revenue we've gotten through our Patreon that has allowed us to staff up is we have a always on resource that once a week is doing a featured story for us that is more often than not a company profile. Um, he's a former staff writer at Betakit, Isabel Kirkwood, and we are giving her all the stories that aren't the funding stories, things that take a little bit more time, require more additional conversation. And she's done tons of company profiles about companies that have just been um, scaling, growing, doing interesting things, or ecosystems that are doing that. So. Um, Honestly, I really think that there's a disconnect in assuming that uh, publications don't want those stories and companies feeling like they don't have a story to tell if they're not raising money. And I just want to fundamentally tell you that that's not true. That's not a guarantee that we're going to write about you, but we're always looking for 
uh, great stories and financing is not a requirement of it. Um, okay. Uh, I saw Jason, Jason had his hand up before and then I thought Jason dropped. seems like Jason is back. Jason, do you got, uh, an emoji, uh, give us a thumbs up here. Do you got a question you wanted to ask? Um, my question is just around, uh, I'm, I'm an investor, so I'm always seeing deals come in. Um, and over the last 24 months, we've just seen deals just come in like every single day. Uh, how are you folks dealing with uh, just that changing landscape of, uh, like you said, funding announcements are taking place all the time, but we're also seeing, you know, massive ac- uh, mergers and acquisitions taking place. Um, how are you, how are you folks d- being able to kind of deal with all that information coming in and how has that kind of changed your, your team's focus on, um, again creating creating that type of content that you said that uh, you know you guys are focused on moving forward uh megan i'm gonna throw to you first because you're you're like <laughs> the, you are literally the watchers on the wall um handling this stuff day by day right you so just for everyone um like megan's our associate editor it's her job to collate all potential news items we might cover whether it's tips pitches we might receive uh, anything else. And then we, we triage that information twice a day to then prioritize assign it to writers. And then Megan works to um, ensure that that happens. So she like literally is the person <laughs> making the beta kit you read every day happen. So Megan, how, how do you feel about everything Jason just talked about? Um, yeah. So we, I just work 24 seven to be able to keep up with it all. No. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, no, it's great. I think it's to the point we were talking about earlier, like a lot is happening. There's a lot of deals, uh, a lot of mergers, acquisitions, a lot of activity, which is so exciting to see. Um, and it just means there's a lot for the beta kit, the, the small, but mighty beta kit team to cover. So, um, yeah, it's just about every day trying to make sure that we are covering the, the big stories, but while keeping, you know, the, um, what may not seem like big stories to most people. So maybe some of the more grassroots community stories like still there. So it's kind of like a balancing act between the two. Is that a good description, Douglas, if I were to, you know? Yeah, what, you, what would you say? You you, yeah. you are both like the boss of other people, your own boss, and you <laughs> oscillate between a variety of different roles day by day, right? Yeah, yeah. I so the hmm, here's where I'm wondering. Like Jason asked a really good question. He's a VC. I'm wondering. I I think at a high level, maybe tying it back to what we were talking about with COVID nineteen. You'll note then that during uh 2020 which fundamentally like kind of changed everything for everyone we completely changed our editorial process stories that we focused on resources that we're allocating and since then particularly in the last year with the launch of our patreon and having more resources to dedicate to stories and us us wanting to have like more value up the chain um like we we fundamentally feel that as the publication record for canadian tech we have to track the deals and the dollars and the activity because honestly if we weren't writing about it no one else would be and we mm. want to be the home for that news. And there's been a lot of days in the past couple of weeks where we're like, you know, there have been a couple of different publications that might have had one of these stories, but we were the only publication that had all of them. And it's, yeah. and, um, I, I draw a lot of pride in that. That being said, Megan is totally right. We are working all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the third podcast I've recorded <laughs> this week, and I don't even write anything. Um, but tying that back without maybe sharing too much, when we launched the Patreon, we weren't really sure we knew what the ask was. We really wanted to get greater support from our ecosystem to allow us to do more of the things. And we wanted to put all of that support into more editorial, better editorial, different editorial coverage of the ecosystem. Uh, As we are approaching the one year of that, we are currently revising what the ask might be when we give it based upon the feedback we've got and, and maybe trying to hone it down versus like, do you want, do you want more of this? Do you want more of that with these things and, and making giving like one specific ask that people can rally around? I will tell you right now, we were very specifically looking at changing the, uh, let's say adding a new news product to beta kit that would at a daily level, give us the ability to in brief cover smaller items, still make sure beta kit is a place where you can find out about it, but not have our team, uh, give the same like amount of dedication to a major news story that we would have have a small news story right now our only option is the blue plate special which is a talented reporter digs in does the reporting 
uh, talks to a bunch of people related and we publish a seven to a thousand word story. We don't have other formats than that. Even our weekly newsletters are a curation of that reporting and then the best reporting from around the world relevant to that vertical. And this podcast is kind of like our meta conversation around what's going on. We don't have a daily, a daily brief, a daily way of just saying like, hey, this thing happened. It's kind of small. Uh, applications are open for this community-based um, cohort or, or, or project or program. And we hate not covering news. We hate saying like, there are a bunch of publications in Canada that I think are very proud to say, this news is too small for us. Um, right now, there's a publication in Canada that won't cover a funding round if it's lower than $25 million. And I, I, that's, um, that just doesn't work for us. But we need to find a way to uh, <laughs> support all of that. And I think you'll see in the next month us make an ask to the ecosystem for support and uh, maybe a clear articulation of how we're going to be changing and adding to beta kit so that day by day we can better handle and, and give you everything that you need, but make sure that we're focusing our attention at each size of story um, in the way that it's best needed. I, I don't know. Our, my director of ops is on this call, so I really don't want to like uh, spoil too much. And I guess this is a podcast going out across the interwebs. But um, if, maybe if you look at our current Patreon page and see some of the goals that we had, and maybe the, some of the ways that I've described it, you might be able to put two plus two together and, and figure that out. Um, okay. Um, Rob is texting me on the sly that um, uh, Sam Sim might have had a uh, question and then took it back. I don't know if she was you know, uh, tired of the whole process there or maybe the question had been answered. But Sam, if, you, uh, if you're interested in asking a question now, I want to I wanna get you up on stage. So hit me, with, uh, hit me with an emoji. Let me know. Got the crying emoji. I'll take that as a yes. She's requested. <laughs> Added as a speaker. This is such a great process. I know. I love the emojis. <laughs> it's such a, it's like, we have a caller, we think. Let's check in with the caller to see if they're a caller. Uh, okay, Sam, you are on, on the line. Uh, what is your question? Yeah, I was curious if there's any new info or stories on the hiring front. I know there were quite a few new stories across Canada about how it was difficult for startups to hire, especially with more competition moving north from the U.S. And as someone who works for a U.S. company, but I'm based in Canada, and my past couple of roles have been the same. I'm just curious to see if you've had any new updates on the on the story there uh hell yes we have and i'm so glad you asked that because i think that was one of the things that we wanted to get to uh on our list of previously submitted questions so this is kind of like a twofer you're knocking one out for us here um i will say yes it has developed um and i would refer you to a story that um uh, our senior writer uh, Charles wrote about, uh, there was recently a report that dropped indicating that basically since 2019, since the start of the pandemic, uh, Canadian salaries have gone up 38%, which is, and now that's the average, uh, factoring that in for like engineering salaries, it's significantly higher. And again, those VCs that I was speaking to about like down rounds, they're like, that's not impacting the talent, um, escalation in terms of this war. So I would strongly recommend you check that story out. I think we published it, I want to say last week, Megan. Uh, yeah, get that. I think but last like, week. The, the hiring battle has not slowed down. Um, I think maybe the circumstance that we're in now, and I'll, I'll shout out the team at Raw Signal Group, um, Jonathan and Melissa Nightingale, because they've been uh, podcast guests in the past. But their uh, newsletter, which dropped this week, was kind of about, okay, a lot of people quit. You know, They said, fuck it. Um, they, they changed jobs. They're in this new place. There's been a ton of transition and there's like a now what, and what is, what is the cultural component of all these people who have switched jobs for a different role for either to get out of a bad job or for a new opportunity with a higher pay, but we're all still working remote and the culture is weird. And, um, basically they were about the vibe check was off. Um, so I, I think that's going to be the continued development. I know for us as a team, particularly in a newsroom with uh, younger and developing journalists, we are um, dying to, if not get back in the office, spend more time around each other because um, a lot of amazing things happen when a bunch of people are working together on a story. And, and that's, it's really great to learn in person, but we, we've been remote for, for two years. Uh, beyond the salaries exploding, I think 
the um the the big thing is just people figuring out how to right size what it means to be working at a company and and culture and and keeping people engaged with that i was i was doing a office hours meet today with a with a company that's working on a slack integration for uh to improve one on ones um and it was it was completely created by someone who during the pandemic was so checked out of remote work that they wanted to build a tool to find a better way to tell their bosses that they were checked out at work. Um, Rob, do you have a perspective there as someone who uh, has worked for some tech companies, been involved in hiring decisions and like, uh, you know, had to deal with this stuff um, from a salary and talent perspective? Um, I think you summarize it pretty well. I think you've got a good overview of the ecosystem. So I think you've, you kind of nailed it. I'd say that like, I don't, we don't see my current experience. We're not seeing anything slowing down. I, again, like, I think we've, we've seen that, like, if the only agency you have in your life is the person at the other end of a two dimensional screen and everything else is the same, it's still hard to not exercise that control <laughs> by switching jobs. And if, uh, I, I actually just spoke to an expat, um, who moved from Canada to Ireland and was working for Google but she's a Canadian. And she was like, I, I didn't even know I was working for Google. <laughs> Honestly, it didn't really matter. No Kit Kat, no all the other things. So I think that we're still deep in the middle of this uh, crazy talent war and not commoditizing yourself and somehow fomenting a culture. That's the thing that everyone's trying to do. It's like, how do you foment a remote first culture um, when you have no real idea of when you're going to be physically back in your office. So yeah. on, on the internet, ooh, who likes that? Exactly. Okay. Uh, Megan, do you want to like weigh in as just like an employee who has to deal with like me as a boss and culture stuff there? Like it, it's a little bit different for us because we cover tech, but we're not really a, a tech company. But uh, any thoughts? <sighs> not a loaded question at all, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Living no, and dying just... on your answer. <laughs> Um, no, I think I've totally felt it because, you know, um, yeah, you're right, boss. I, I do one-on-ones with you, right? Like, like I've felt that kind of remoteness, but I also like manage the writing team at Beta Kit. So I've kind of felt it from both sides, which is really interesting as an employee, but also as like someone who manages people. And while you can totally get used to it and you can, and you can do everything that you would typically do in an office, I think how things come across or how people learn like people don't get to see my face when i'm making really stupid sarcastic jokes you know what i mean and and i think like yeah that just sounds like she hates everything yeah i mean everyone thinks i'm just the worst person at beta kid (laughs) um (laughs) but um but i think yeah i i really miss that i i miss being able to sit beside someone and just kind of easily explain what's going on what's happening or have those conversations it's um like at the beginning of the pandemic, you're like, oh, okay, this, this remote work thing, I, I can do it. And now kind of two years in, it's like, I could use a little bit less. I could use yeah. a little bit more in person. Yeah. I think that's a great answer. Like, you know, we, we actually, Megan and I had our one-on-one today and we were trying to do it over Google meet, which, uh, is a trash fire of a, service. <laughs> and Megan actually phoned in. So she, she, she called into Google meet, which is kind of, you know, isn't worth it. And then I was remotely connected on my AirPods uh, in the kitchen, uh, making pizza pockets. Uh, I think we had a great conversation, but it was definitely very different from when we used to be uh, working out of a co-working space at King and Bathurst. And we would yeah. uh, like literally walk to the dog park on one-on-ones, go hang out yeah. with dogs and check in with each other. Um, yeah. So I, I very much miss those dogs and I hope they're doing okay. We've gone an out. We've never done an AMA where people keep asking more questions. So we should probably end it soon. But uh, I'm willing to throw out all the questions that were submitted previously for those that are live because I've seen the com- questions that were submitted previously and they're very, very difficult and hard. All right, caller, you're on, you're on the line. What is your question? Hi there. Um, I think with the uh, y- you let off the conversation talking about Ukraine, and I can't help but connect. Um, some of the news that's happening nationally here to some of the conversation that's happening with um, technology overlapping with politics. And I feel like one of the 
not to really like bring it and not to bring up politics more. I'm just curious about the lens with which you do reporting and how there are these political events that are impacting business success and business stories like supply chain opportunities, working from home, but even just financial technologies and financial services. There's this very intense conversation happening about happening around the right to transact. And there are capital controls in like Eastern European countries too. So yeah. it's uh um it's kind of wild. So I'm really I guess maybe just to bring it home. Um I'm curious about being like apolitical in reporting or even just pointing at politics when you're talking about technology business news. Thanks. Uh, that is a great question and God damn you, because it was definitely similar to some of the questions that we've been asked uh, previously that I was hoping to put. I was really hoping this is going to be a puppies question or another one about one-on-ones or COVID easy topics, but yeah, it's something um, l- listen, there's a lot of questions right now, or there, mm, there's a lot of misconceptions about the role of journalism and what it's for and how we come across our reporting or our, our lens and perspective. Uh, questions of of bias or intent or you know what's what's in our beat or not i think you know um i was remarking to the team earlier today that this isn't the first time in my life i've seen um an eastern european con- country kind of invaded um but since the internet and since social media where we are all more connected it's the the idea that there is a war going on between an imaginary geographical border just seems all the more uh, frivolous. Um, and, and it makes, it makes the whole thing more stupid and shameful uh, on the converse. Uh, we've, we've been, um, I think as a team collectively increasing our understanding of what's happening in the cryptocurrency and the NFT space. So uh, William, hold on here. Check me if I, if I go too crazy, but uh some of the things that we've been wrestling with is um, the quote unquote business success of those considerations, but then the broader societal impact we consider like what we, we categorize as impact stories to be primus, uh, primary primary beta kit, whether that is stories of underrepresented founders uh, impact uh, on technology for good or ill, just the broader social considerations. And we're always looking for, how we can communicate that in a responsible and context filled way. That doesn't mean that we're jumping on it every day, but we're certainly talking about it and choosing our spots. Now a podcast like this is a lot easier to do because the the work around that's more difficult, but um, we have been very much paying attention to how crypto enthusiasts have responded to the idea that um, governments still have control over um financial transactions and uh, responding radically and negatively to the idea that uh, if you are um, financially supporting illegal acts, that you, <laughs> that that's a bad wrong thing. And that uh, there's some controls over that, which has been historically true forever. But um, I think the, the crypto people are, are really coming to um, the point with that idea of like, no, the whole purpose of us creating this technology is to not be told by anyone that we can, uh, what we can or can't do with money, uh, which is beyond the technology supporting that, an idea that attacks the normal, the the current social order, democracies, law and order. I uh, very much recommend you check out the uh, the recent uh, Decoder uh, podcast episode uh, with uh, Nilay Patel uh, from The Verge, uh, interviewing um, an expert lawyer in the crypto and web three space about, you know, certain things like DAOs are not recognized as legal entities <laughs> in a variety of places. Um, and therefore uh, the default for those organizations, if DAOs are not legally rec- uh, recognized is that everyone involved is considered a general partner and then um, uh, legally responsible for any of the actions of the DAO, which is probably a wake up call to people who are signing up to those things. Um, yeah, I like, there are a variety of intersections with 
technology and culture and politics and democracy because technology is subsumed by everything and as as a as a business publication focused on tech startups and innovations we can't ignore that we're not here to be a booster for an ecosystem um we're here to report on what's happening with con context and there have been a number of times where we have said uh this is a bad actor in the space or this talk not technology isn't good um or there are there is collateral damage cause and i think um you're only going to be seeing more conversations like that because there are more touch points where that's happening um megan do you have any thoughts on that when it comes down to like a story by story level like i i went pretty wide lens with how we approach it as a publication and maybe what we do behind the scenes of either you know, stories that we don't write about because we don't want to amplify things that seem a little shady or the the work that we do to add context around a conversation that isn't just like, hey, people made money off of doing this thing, business success. But at a at a story by story level, when you're reporting on a company or a space, and um, I think there are a couple of examples where we've talked about um, how employees get paid <laughs> mm. uh, and the, the technology services there this year and whether or not that's like legally viable. How do you approach it at a, like a, just a story by story level? Mm. Yeah, I think you put it pretty well when you're talking, I guess, high level is we're not just here to report on like the news that comes in on, you know, onto our desk. It, it's mm -hmm. contextualizing that for the ecosystem. So what does this mean? What's happening overall? What are some of the themes, you know, that are happening, not just like the day-to-day -day news. So I think that kind of plays into a bit of our story by story reporting as well. Right. When you see something coming in, maybe it's related to the crypto stuff you're talking about or whatever. Oh, we've seen some stuff like this in the past. Oh, uh, okay. Maybe we're noting that in this story, kind of pulling those threads together for people to understand. I think one thing as a journalist that I've especially heard over the past few years is like, <laughs> I think there's that misconception where, well, can't speak for all journalists, obviously, but, but that you come at your stories from a certain lens, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, you're writing the story from this lens or you're writing it from that opposite. Like I've, I've gotten a lot of comments. You've got an agenda. I have an agenda. And I'm here to say I really don't. I mean, shout out to Carleton Journalism School. Like I was told, like if I was biased in any of my work, like like that was the worst possible thing that was gonna happen. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I was afraid of getting a finger chopped off or something. Like not actually, I joke. But you know what I mean? It was like no, Carleton's rough. You get your. <laughs> But it was just like, you know what I mean? And, and that's something I, of course I have thoughts about maybe certain things or, or politics or whatever, but what I do, my job, what I'm paid to do is, is not bring that into my work. And I work very hard not to do that. And how you do that on the story by story basis, like you're talking about is just understanding the space and trying to contextualize story by story. I, that probably seems really vague to a lot of people. No, well, let's um, let's but, an example, because you just did yeah. a really good job recently with a, a report. I think it was from uh, CVCA and Diversio on, again, just the constant reporting of like, hey, um, we're, we're improving the diversity within tech companies and boards of white women, but the broad level inclusion is not there. Uh, yeah. And it's a bit of a same old story. And mm -hmm. now, obviously, I'd say, I, I think you'd be okay with me saying like, you have a, a personal investment in the realities <laughs> that that story is reported on. Yeah. But in that one specifically, we did a lot of work to make sure that that story was informed by your perspective, past reporting, how mm -hmm. important this is, setting in context. But it wasn't like Megan Rant, here's another thing. Like only, only thing we could back up in our reporting was included. Yes, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Because of course, I I have feelings about <laughs> how diverse teams should be, and and the ROI you get from that, and all that stuff, right? Um, and um, of course, I want to see that move forward positively. And when it doesn't, that's like personally hard for me. But I, I'm not an opinion writer. That's not what I do. I'm here yep. to write facts. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to write the story based on what we have, pull in reports that tell you ROI comes from, or like better return comes from having diversity. Like I, I'm only pulling in facts.
You know yeah. what I mean? That that I can find back up, verify. So maybe I've gone on a little rant here. I, I no, apologize no, if I, I have, like, but yeah. Because we, I think part of the reason why there are certain things that we would say on a podcast that we wouldn't publish on beta kit in print because of the differences in the format. And because again, I, I think a lot of people don't realize like we get, we get stories that we publish lawyered. We get them reviewed to ensure mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. not only we have an editorial fact check to ensure the information is accurate and, and right and reads well and is, is engaging, but also that we could not be that that information could not be misinterpreted or we could be yeah. sued for, for libel or, or failing the diligence of that process. Um, Quinn, I would strongly recommend actually you check out the last podcast episode that we just did talking about Joe Rogan, because I think the intersection there that we're seeing the difficulty of us taking a very traditional journalistic approach to media in the 22nd, 21st century, jeepers creepers, uh, in 2022. Um, but the democratization and decentralization of media means that there's a variety of people that don't hold to the traditional professional standards that are accruing influence and honestly it might seem more appealing because they're more direct or don't see as seem as hamstrung as journalists often do to like bend over backwards to get things right or even to not appear as if we have an agenda um but aren't then doing the work to ensure that they're not spreading misinformation or um that things are coming across in a way that doesn't create more problems and on that episode, we had Joshua Kane from the Globe and Mail and Katie Jensen of Vocal Fry Studios, who's produced a number of great podcasts. And we really struggled to figure out how to reconcile that. So I, I, I'd recommend you check out that conversation because we don't necessarily have an easy answer. We go day by day um, with people thinking that we are the marketing arm of Canadian tech and then also being accused of being like, racist or having an agenda if we ask if a local based accelerator should have Canadian companies in it. Um, like, so we're kind of used to getting hit from either side. And that's usually an indication that we're right where we should be in the, in the um, gooey center of the care milk bar of reporting. But um, it's a, it's a constant process of checking to make sure we're not outside the bounds. Um, okay. That was a 20 minute question. An answer. I feel like we can do one more and close this out. Um, does anyone got a, a question to close this off? And maybe we'll we'll end on um, you know, the best question ever that's ever happened in a Twitter Spaces or an AMA podcast. I'm super open for a softball question where I'm not ranting about something. We don't need to end on Megan ranting. Yeah, these are these are <laughs> these AMAs are hard. They're always our most popular episodes, but they they kind of break us down. Um, <laughs> Our director of ops says that she can't emoji because she's listening to this on desktop, which is a BS answer. But there was one question that she personally asked today that she wanted uh, to ensure. And she's honestly, she'll make my life uh, absolutely miserable um, if I, if I don't include it. So I'm probably incentivized to make sure it's asked. And the question is essentially, um, do you think Beta Kit's Sunicorn predictions uh, are on track to become unicorns this year? So for context, we were at SAS North last year. Uh, we worked with them to produce the Beta Kit main stage, and we had a session on uh, not just, there was a lot of unicorns at SAS North in November, but we wanted to have a conversation about Sunicorns because we feel like there are, uh, and I feel like William can back me up on this, there's not a lot of companies that get the attention that they deserve until they're the obvious success and then they get celebrated. So we wanted to kind of uh, call our shot a bit and say, hey, here's some companies right now that you don't have to wait for two years until they're on the main stage at TechCrunch Disrupt or um, Recode Decode um, that you should be paying attention to. And we had, uh, oh God, we who do we have on that stage? I should really remember who those are before I, I think say it on our Boast was there. Um, we had Boast. We had Tealbook, and we had um, oh Christ, Rewind, Rewind. Thank yeah. you, an Ottawa-based company. Um, three companies that we thought were really like primed to kind of explode. I don't know, Megan. I'll let you go first. Any of those you think are going to be unicorns this year? Call your shot. Oh my God! You're just you're just trying to not answer this question yourself. You just want to make me answer. I gotta I have to facilitate. <laughs> oh man, um, 
you know what? I, I see all three of those companies have really cool and interesting things going on. So I would definitely say there's probably positive growth for them. Do I want to say, are they going to be unicorns this year? And then at the end of the year, someone's going to be like, see, they didn't. And then someone's going to come back. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, well to, Quinn's, to Quinn's question, like that's the fear that we say something that might not happen. And then we not only have egg on our face, we're accused of being, you know, biased boosters yeah. for a specific company. Like, yeah, this is this is what slowly kills journalists over the course of their careers. But you know what I will say is I'm interested in each of those companies' stories and and what they're doing, and I personally want to continue to track them. So whatever that means, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's where I'm kind of at. Okay, and that was an effective weaseling out of the question. Uh, great job, Megan. Rob. You you got no horse in this race. You're just a podcast co-host. <laughs> what do you think? You also didn't I, pick any of those three companies, so I, you're I did completely not. Completely not beholden. Well, look, here's my fake weaseling out of the question. I think it. I think I don't care. <laughs> what I mean. What I mean by that is that's good. Fun. This sort of unicorn obsession bullshit <laughs> um, is kind of crazy. If the, these are great companies, great Canadian companies. If they impact our, uh, the, create the impact that they're already creating, if they could continue to scale that impact, if they could continue to attract the right kinds of talent and build the right kinds of talent in the ecosystem and then create wealth in our ecosystem, if there are 750 million corns, I don't know what you call a not unicorn, <laughs> but they generate that kind of impact in our ecosystem, that's fucking good. And IPOing and unicorns and narwhals and all that shit who cares are we creating great canadian companies yes those are three examples of great canadian companies i love that that, that I, I think that was a really good way of putting it because the same thing when i'm talking to founders or ceos it's like hey you guys reach unicorn status oh you're going public and it's always like yeah this is just a milestone we're looking to build a hundred year company we we want to build a strong canadian company and, and that that really echoes rob what you're kind yeah. of saying so it's, you know, it's a gr another great non-answer, but I do agree. And oh, yeah. obviously I mentioned before <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the Patreon live panel that we did um, two days ago, two days ago uh, with Truly You uh, and uh, Cleo, they were pretty adamant on that. We've had Steve Munford on BetaKit uh, multiple times, uh, basically saying like, we need to stop caring about unicorns for, I think all the reasons Rob outlined. I'm in agreement with that. Uh, but I am going to say, fuck it. This is an AMA. I keep it real. <laughs> I'm going to call my shots. Uh, I think it's going to be rewind because I think every SaaS company in the world gets to a certain point is going to need rewind. And that's a great, <laughs> um, being, being in the, in the market of selling to tech giants is a great business to be in. And, uh, I'm calling it. Yeah.